Hi, I'm Paul Taylor, and I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'm the federal NDP candidate for Parkdale High Park, and I'm also the executive director at FoodShare, and somehow I managed to squeeze in teaching at Simon Fraser University. For today's conversation on It's Our Time to Lead, we'll be talking about climate change, or more appropriately, the climate emergency before us. Fighting climate change is our utmost and urgent priority as citizens, activists, and leaders. We have less than nine years to maintain a chance of limiting global, global heating to 1.5 degrees, and it's going to take all of us. It's our time to be bold. To explore how we can do that and what needs to happen, I'll be joined by my good friend Seth Klein, a social activist for over 30 years and a former teacher like me. But Seth is now the team lead and director of strategy with the Climate Emergency Unit. Now, prior to that, he served for 22 years as the founding director of the British Columbia Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, or the CCPA, Canada's foremost social justice think tank. I'm proud to have served on the board for a little bit and have had the opportunity to work alongside Seth. Now, Seth's new book, it's fire. That is the best way to describe it in more ways than one. It's called A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And it explores how we can align our politics and the economy with what the science says that we must do to address the climate crisis. Hello, Seth. It's so good to see you, my friend. Hey, Paul. It's great to see you, even if this way. This is true. It's, you know, it's been a while, and I'm really happy to have you here. Welcome to the conversation, and thanks for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to speak with you again. Well, I'm really happy to do this with you. Awesome. All right, so let's join in. Let's dive in. Uh, Seth, this topic has been close to your heart for a long time. You've been a climate champion, an anti-poverty activist, among other things, for as long as I've known you. What brought you to this work, and what sustains you in it? Yeah. Well, the social justice work, I don't know. I think that's just in the blood. Um, you know, my, my, my parents were political, my grandparents were political, my great-grandparents were political. Um, and I think I knew from a very young age that, uh, that, that somehow you got to be engaged in making the world a better place. I can't, I, I can't remember a time, uh, actually, when I didn't kind of have that notion uh, in my head. Um, uh, as you mentioned, for me, the, you know, we all, we all struggle to find our place in that struggle. Uh, and for me, for a long time, that was with the public policy, progressive public policy, social justice research institute. Um, and I came to it, uh, well, I, I should say I came to the environment stuff and the climate stuff through a social justice lens. I mean, when you and I first started working together, it was in doing anti-poverty work uh, in, mm -hmm. in where I am, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil otherwise known as Vancouver, uh, when you were out here for a spell. Um, and, but for me, the climate isn't just an environment issue. It's, it's, it's a human survival issue. It's a social justice issue. It's a human rights issue. It's a labor issue. Uh, and I, I, that's the lens by which I come to it. The CCPA British Columbia office really started digging into the climate issue over a dozen years ago. Mm -hmm. And once you, you know, once you're starting to follow the literature and the science on this, you can't help but become increasingly alarmed. And when I left the CCPA two and a half years ago, I knew I wanted to spend more time on climate. I was feeling increasingly anxious. Mm -hmm. And in the CCPA, you're forever in this space between, uh, your belief about what the way policy should be mm. and what our politics seems prepared to consider mm. and no more so than when it comes to climate mm. where we all stare down this harrowing gap between that urgent scientifically uh, uh, rooted timeline that you spelled out there and what our politics seems prepared to entertain I wanted to spend more time trying to tackle that gap I love that you bring that up, Seth. One of the things I've been thinking about and talking about, you know, in a lot of social justice spaces or activist spaces, we talk about policy windows. And I've come to realize that policy windows are harmful. They are windows that are designed by other folks, not necessarily the folks who are feeling the brunt of the issues that we're trying to tackle. So really like that you acknowledge that. And actually, I want to go, I want to help people listening really understand how grave this situation is. So I guess my next question for you is, if we don't act boldly in tackling the climate emergency now, what does life look like for future generations? In a word, horrific. 
um, if we don't dramatically start to uh, to put this in the parlance that we've all come to know in this pandemic, bend the curve mm. on our GHG emissions, uh, then then our children and grandchildren and those who will live out the rest of this century uh, are facing a future that is unlivable for many, um, deeply disruptive and uncomfortable for everyone else, mm -hmm. quite possibly ungovernable. Um, and, uh, you know, for all of us, you know, we, we've all just lived through an extraordinary year that was extremely disruptive. Mm -hmm. uh, but we ain't seen nothing if we don't get serious. I mean, the one thing as disruptive as this past year has been, at no point, at least for us in Canada, were our food and water systems disrupted. Um, that's what starts to happen with climate. And it's a whole other order of magnitude of, of disruption. I think un un ungovernable. I'm so glad that you are, you know, willing to take us to what the reality could be if we don't act boldly now. Because I think for many of us, you know, many people are, are, are afraid um, to even really dive into bold action. Um, but I think part of that is because they don't realize how catastrophic things could get. And yeah. you know, although that said, you know, I I spend very little time in that space myself or in my book. You know, I, I try to take as a starting point, as a given, what the science is telling us about that path and and then try to move the discussion, like, what do we do to avoid that that path? Um, because it's a hard space to live in. I, I agree. I agree. But so now I come to the case of, of Canada and what's happened here. We have set numerous emissions reduction targets and we have consistently failed to meet them. Why do you think that is? And why do you think we allow that to happen? Uh, and what exactly is it that needs to change? Yeah, uh, there's a lot in that question, Paul. Um, so first of all, uh, for those, uh, just so we're all on the same page, if you were to look at Canada's greenhouse gas emissions going back for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. what you would see is a, is a flat plateaued line, which is to say our emissions in Canada are no longer going up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the best you can say. Um, uh, we have not um, put them on a downward trajectory, despite making all these proclamations and promises, and and and, uh, and yet we don't meet them. Um, uh, this bill C twelve that I, I hope is about to pass the Senate and become law, you know, is it an improvement? It is an improvement. Mm -hmm. um, is it what it needs to be in terms of an accountability bill to truly hold this and future governments to account to meet these targets? It is not yet. Um, uh, so why does that happen? First of all, it's important to point out that this is not true for all countries. Mm. In fact, if you look at uh, Canadians have this perception that we're leaders. <laughs> we're not. I'm not on this file. Mm. Uh, in fact, pretty much everyone else in the G7 is kicking our asses. Um, uh, and so uh, we can and should do better. Um, a big piece of it is because of, of the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. The extraction and export of fossil fuels is one quarter of our emissions. Mm -hmm. And while we have governments that say they want to take action on climate, they don't want to touch that. Mm -hmm. Instead, they want to keep telling what is in the end a lie which is that we can take action on climate and still double down on the expansion and export of fossil fuels, and you can't make the math work. Um, and that is what I call the new climate denialism in, in my book, right? That, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like the old denialism where you say, you know, just like Donald Trump or Maxine Bernier, but the new climate denialism is actually much more insidious and widespread and problematic, which is to say you accept the science, but you don't really. Uh, you don't follow the logic of what it says we, we have to do. So that's a part of it. It's, it so it's the, it's the power of that industry. It's, it's the continual effort to, and I use this term advisedly, appease that industry, right? We have each time, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you're running, and I so badly want you to win, but I'm going to say this is true for provincial NDP governments too. When they bring in climate plans, they want to have representatives of the fossil fuel industry on the stage with them saying this is a good plan. We can get behind this. And what I'm saying is any climate plan with it, which at this late hour 
is a plan that the industry can find comfort in won't be a plan worth having. Mm, that's brilliantly put. You know, when I was reading your book, the thing that uh, stuck out to me when I was le reading about the new climate denialism is it sounded like inhaling, trying to inhale and exhale at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd use that. I wish I'd use that. <laughs> it's not possible. And I thought yeah. about that same inhaling and exhaling when, you know, the federal government declared a climate emergency one day and then spent billions of public dollars on a pipeline the next day. It's that inhaling and exhaling that we... That is, the, that is a manifestation of the new climate denialism. Such a good point. So back to your book. Your book is all about, I found it really interesting, it was all about how, you know, during World War II, uh, people were mobilized to come together to fight against or, or fight for a common cause. Now, I want to pivot just a little bit, actually, and say, do you think that the pandemic uh, presents a similar opportunity for us to fight for something transformative? Absolutely, it does. Um, you know, the timing was so weird, Paul. Like, I wrote the whole book before the pandemic. I had, I had sent it off for final copy edit three days before the first lockdown. And uh, that all threw me into a bit of a panic, like, like that, that maybe the whole premise of the book was out the window, right? Because I thought we needed an historic reminder hmm. of how quickly we can move and to, and to excavate that story. And then here we all are in real time uh, experiencing just that. In the end, it all reinforces. Um, you know, and, and so I, because the book has now come out, you know, in this pandemic year, it's given me a lot of chance to think about these parallels between across emergencies, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the war, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's systemic racism, whether it's climate, here's, they all have certain things in common. So first of all, all emergencies start with a period of denial. Interesting. Um, you know, and that was true in the pandemic too, right? We can all remember 16 months ago, seven, you know, starting to hear about this virus, but n we were all in denial about how it was going to upend our lives. Mm. And then, in, in, similarly, they all go through uh, uh, a process, uh, an alchemy of, of some combination of events and leadership mm. that shifts the popular zeitgeist into emergency mode. That happened in the war, because it didn't happen out of the gate on the war. It took work, it took leadership. It took the same in the pandemic, right? I, I remember the events. I remember, I remember when they canceled the NBA season. I don't even watch basketball, Paul. <laughs> but I remember when that happened, I was thinking, whoa, this is different. Um, and then I also know that it took seeing our prime minister in front of his house every morning. That communicated emergency. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think, you know, the, around around in indigenous races, racism towards indigenous people and black people, we've seen a similar kind of shift in, in the zeitgeist over the last year. On climate, the popular zeitgeist actually is starting to shift and the leadership hasn't caught up yet. This is such a good point and, and such an important point. You know, the pandemic also showed us what happens when we want to fight a threat like we actually want to win and sometimes i think the government may have done that mistakenly and i i think we needed to be a, a shook like that and recognize that you know we should challenge our expectations our low expectations yes. of government and i think that's what your book does brilliantly really demonstrates that you know government has a really important role to play in in create helping to shift the population uh, into action you know, so first of all, when you say low expectations, I think you're dead on. Like, um, when, you know, this sort of goes back to your earlier question. What holds us back? Why aren't we meeting our targets? Part of this, to my mind, is the, the legacy of 40 years of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that legacy, you know, it has all kinds of, you know, it's the legacy of spending cuts and tax cuts and privatization and deregulation and the whole gamut. But its most insidious legacy is the sapping of our ambition, our, 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 our faith and our capacity to do grand things together. Um, and that has undermined those expectations. Um, but I think you're right that the, that the pandemic 
liberates us from that though, that that kind of straitjacket in our thinking in some important ways. So when I talk about you know, ever since my book came out, I get asked all the time, how do you know when a government or a political party or any large institution is actually in emergency mode? Mm. And, and I have my four markers of when you know. Okay. And they are, it spends what it takes to win. That's the one you just referred to. It creates new institutions to get the job done. It moves from voluntary to mandatory measures as needed. And it tells the truth. And we did all of those big time in the war. I would actually say the Trudeau government hits those four markers with respect to the pandemic. You know, we can quibble about the areas where they should have done other things faster or whatever, but I think they, they hit all four markers. With respect to the climate emergency, they hit none of them. And just to zero in on the money point you were raising, just to give you one comparison, mm -hmm. in the, for the entire first year of the pandemic, from that very first lockdown in March of 2020, the Bank of Canada was buying up federal government securities to finance the emergency response to the tune of $5 billion a week. Wow. But in response to climate, the Trudeau government is currently spending about $5 billion a year. Wow. wow. That's the contrast. Wow. One's emergency, one is not. That is such a good point. Thank you for that, Seth. And, you know, we constantly, you touched on this a little bit, but we constantly see, you know, Canada's mining giants, oil and gas companies, the logging industry, and a whole bunch of others actively working to block meaningful action on climate. And I think one of the things that I hear more and more, um, you know, everyday folks, they want to know, how can we help inspire real climate action in this context? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, one, one piece of it is... Uh, what I was getting at before, that we have governments that want to appease those industries, right? I think there's a real impulse in Canadian politics that we just want a plan that everyone can get behind. We don't need everyone to get behind a plan. And you never get that anonymity. You didn't get it on the war. You, you get your anti-social dissenters on pandemic. Who cares? We don't need everybody. Um, and on climate, you know, there are, there are those industries that can and must transition, and there are those fossil fuel industries that can and must be wound down. Mm -hmm. And so if a climate plan is not making those industries deeply anxious about their future, again, I would say it's not a plan worth having. Um, and I think, I think the whole climate fight's been too bloodless, mm -hmm. too, too polite. Um, uh, so I think there's something about naming what we're up against. You know, just to stick with the World War II metaphor a bit more, when FDR in the States was, when, when Roosevelt was being prepped, you know, he had a lot of corporate people who hated his guts. And uh, his rejoinder to that was, I welcome their hate. Um, there's another piece of this, though, and that is that the basic level of climate literacy is very poor in Canada. Mm -hmm. And by which I mean, if you poll Canadians, what you it's a very mixed bag. You, you find a public that is increasingly anxious about climate. They, a majority now see it as an emergency. They want to see action. But only about half of Canadians correctly identify the main source of global warming as the, burn, the combusting of fossil fuels. So you, when you talk to them about it, they go, you probably experienced this at the doorstep. You, you talk about climate and they go right to recycling and plastics mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. because that's what's been hardwired. Mm -hmm. And if you're the liberals, you, you can make a ton of mischief with that, which is to say you can give people the impression you are totally. doing something when you are not. Totally. Um, and so we need, to, we need our institutions, both government and media, to do that education, to boost that literacy so that at least we can be clear what it is we're up against and what it is we have to change. This is so true, Seth. And I, 
feel like you and I are so aligned in so many ways, and I think this this kind of way of thinking is so important, and I think could be applied to so many other issues, whether it's housing, the housing crisis, whether it's poverty, food insecurity. You know, we've been convinced that handing out leftover food is the response. We even see our prime minister, you know, sorting tins at food banks when, you know, the media has a responsibility, I agree, to play a, 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 real, a really important role in helping us hold our government to account. And, and helping us understand the issues that we uh, that we face, and the media did in the war. By the way, I mean this is what's interesting: is uh, you know CBC was created three years before World War II, and in the states, the CBS news team played a key role in bringing about a twenty percent change in U.S. public opinion about entry wow. into that fight. Wow. Um, and so I think you know with our me- we want our media to be science based and factual and evidence-based, but in the face of a civilizational threat, we also want them to pick a goddamn side. <laughs> and in the war, they did. And Canadians would have been appalled if they hadn't. Absolutely. Um, and in the pandemic, they did, right? In the pandemic, the journalists did their job. They retooled their kitchen tables and kept us informed on a daily basis. If we could do that, you know, I look at the CBC in particular as our public broadcaster, and, and you know, you're running federally, and they're federally regulated. Um, you know, if every morning on every hour we can get a sports and business report, surely we could have a morning climate emergency report that factually and scientifically tells us how this fight for our lives is unfolding at home and abroad every morning, just like they did in the war. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you, Seth. One thing I want to ask you about is something that I've been hearing about recently that I think is really compelling. There have been these movements around the world to protect bodies of water, rivers, and forests by recognizing them as having rights. Mm. Do you think things like that could work in Canada? And if so, uh, what do you think the impact uh, could potentially be? Well, there are moves in Canada to, to secure rights for nature. I know the David Suzuki Foundation has had a long time effort in that regard, and I think those efforts are certainly worth uh, pursuing. Uh, my caveat would be, I'm in emergency mode now. I'm all about emergency. And the path to legal and especially constitutional reform mm-hmm. is painfully slow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm happy to have some people pursuing that track, uh, but I'm, I'm not prepared to hang our success on the climate fight on, on the success of that effort. We don't have time. Okay, great. I want to talk about money. I want to talk about uh, a wealth tax. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about um, you know, the lack of a meaningful wealth tax in this country. Do you think a wealth tax will help raise enough to provide some real money to fight the climate crisis, again, like we want to win? It could absolutely raise a lot of money. Um, sort of keep going back to the war here like your weird uncle or something. But um, So in the war, federal spending increased tenfold. Uh, we finished World War II with a debt-to-GDP ratio well over 100%, so more than double what it is even after this year of pandemic spending. Um, about half of that was raised through new taxes and half through the Bank of Canada uh, and, and selling victory bonds. Um, I, I think we want a, a similar kind of mix today uh, as we tackle the climate emergency. So we're going to need a whole bunch of new taxes, mm-hmm. and they need to be raised in a progressive way. And a a wealth tax absolutely should be uh, a key piece of that. In fact, it's not just about the money that it raises. Mm -hmm. Here's an important theme in my book. It's that mobilizations, true society-wide mobilizations, require social solidarity. Mm -hmm. And inequality is toxic to social solidarity. In the First World War, to go further back uh, with you, Paul, Mm -hmm. in the First World War, huge inequality and rampant profiteering, like grotesque profiteering, mm-hmm. undermined uh, that social solidarity, it undermined mobilization, it undermined recruitment. That's why we had the, 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 the conscription crisis in the First World War. So Mackenzie King at the beginning of the Second World War was very cognizant of this. And so he brings in the first major income transfer programs, he brings in unemployment insurance and the family allowance in the war. But he also significantly increases taxes on the wealthy and corporations, not just not only increasing the rate, but he has a cap on corporate taxes. 
uh, uh, in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way that was structured, so first of all, like you think about these companies that have profiteered in the pandemic, again, obscenely. That was illegal in the Second World War. Wow. The way it was structured in the war is they went back to the four years before the war. They averaged out by sector what the average profit was. And remember, those are depression years, 36 to 39. Okay. And then they went to every company in the land and said, that's your annual limit until the war is over. Wow. Amazing, eh? Wow. So, so much is possible. So much is... And, and, and leading business figures of that era gave speeches to their fellow business leaders that they had to suck it up and accept this because that's what it meant to mobilize together. This is so true. I, I'm going to change up again, Seth, because I live in a community with quite a few artists. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things I love that I've heard you say is you've talked about art and artists playing key roles in mobilizing people. So tell me more about that. How do you see the arts and artists contributing to efforts to tackle the climate emergency? Yeah. I mean, so I have a little section in the book on, on this um, because as I was writing it, it started to dawn on me. Again, you know, I, I started looking at the economic comparisons, but then I started to see all these other comparisons, including the role of the arts. You know, in, in the First World War, we, at like the first, we, we had painters going to, went to the front and painted the war, and the National Film Board was pumping out documentaries. We had these posters that were ubiquitous. The war had a popular soundtrack. Mm -hmm. it, it, Hollywood star, stars sold victory bonds. Like, mm -hmm. it was everything about our cultural lives told us we were living in a time of emergency. Mm -hmm. And I think... Every mobilization, every great mobilization needs the arts. Um, and I've been trying to challenge artists today to say, you know, this mobilization is also going to need the arts. There are neat things happening, um, but we're not there yet. The, most of the artistic work on climate, whether it's uh, literature or visual arts, music, it's, to the extent that it starts to address climate, it's dystopian. Mm. Yeah? Now, that makes sense. It's scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it's interesting to me that in the main, the arts and music from the, from the war, despite the context being horrific, was not dystopian. Mm. It, ra it was rallying us. So I've been trying to engage artists, it, particularly since the book came out, to say, like, Give us our, give us art again. Give us the soundtrack again, but like the war, don't just, you know. There's some fear inevitably. We're motivated by fear and hope, so also rally us. Um, and I put that challenge to when I had my book openings uh, in, in in the fall. I had a musical opener for each one, and I and I wow. tried to ask each of those musicians like, give us a, a climate emergency song but also make it hope, give us some, get rally us. And a, it's, and a number of them took me up on that. I love that. You know, I'm going to make a call tomorrow morning to a number of my drag queen friends uh, who have these captivating audiences and I, who, I, who, I, I'm, who are working on my campaign or helping me with my, with my campaign, who are really interested in a more just world, who are really interested in truly uh, tackling the climate emergency. So I'd love to see, you know, drag queens, uh, drag queens for, uh, for tackling the climate emergency. Awesome. So I may send some your way. Uh, okay. But, um, um, you know, we talked about hope. Tell me about what climate mm. movements or leaders are you looking to for inspiration these days? Well, first of all, the, the, uh, the book is littered with such people, um, both then and now. Mm -hmm. uh, so often these people are uh, the rule breakers, um, the people who defied the, the rules and norms of their time in order to do what was required in the face of a civilizational threat. Uh, there's a bit of a Where's Waldo game in the book, I think, you know, spot the rule breaker then and now. <laughs> And then at the end, I try to make a point of listing them all. Um, and in the present, you know, they are the student strikers who skip school to do what's necessary. The, they are the indigenous land defenders. Uh, they are Extinction Rebellion people who are following in a tradition of, of peaceful civil disobedience that has been, at, you know, uh, we can't, you can't think of a single 
major social successful social movement that didn't include some form of peaceful civil disobedience. Um, these are the people that posterity will remember. Mm -hmm. um, I take a lot of hope from the, the youth-led stuff. Um, and I think it's important to appreciate and remind ourselves how just before the pandemic, momentum was really building, right? I mean, we had that incredible day of student action, on the largest single day of protest in Canadian history. Then a month before the first lockdown, we had that string of solidarity actions mm -hmm. in support of the Wet'suwet'en, which none of us had ever seen before. Um, so that all gives me hope. But your hope question is always a bit fraught for me, Paul. Because um, uh, the truth is, any of us who follow this science wrestle with despair. Mm -hmm. We walk a razor's edge. And uh, I think we should be honest about that. But here's where I take some solace from my World War II research. Um, in World War II, Canada was a population a little over 11 million. And from that, uh, over a million of them enlisted. I mean, that's just mind-boggling, wow. isn't it, as a, as a wow. percent? 64% of them were under the age of 21. So again, youth-led. But you know what they didn't know? What's that? If they would win. Mm. Like we, it's, to say that is to state the obvious, you know, and yet we, we, it's, we, we know how the story ended, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Mm. And there was a good chunk of the war's early years where the outcome was anything but certain. And, and they did it anyway. And I think that's the spirit in, with which we have to approach the climate emergency. That is a really important reminder. Thank you for that, Seth. What do you think is the most important thing that this country needs to do, what our, our, our federal leaders need to do in the next three months? We just have to enter true emergency mode, right? So, I mean, I'm just asking, inviting people to use these four markers I use. Spend what it takes. Create new institutions. Create crown or corporations, new crown corporations to just get the, the job done, mm -hmm. right? Instead of just trying to give tax cuts or signals, like, just look at what we should. You know what we should have done in the pen? Let me go back. Okay. I know we're over time. That's okay. I said the Trudeau government did a lot of stuff right on the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know what they didn't do and they should have done? That people like Linda McQuaid talk about and Matthew Green. They should have created, recreated a new crown corporation to mass produce vaccines. And because they didn't, we become reliant on others. And worse than that, we, we, we use our economic might to outbid poorer countries, which is the opposite of what we did in the war. In the war, we were the arsenal for our allies. Mm -hmm. And we did that through the creation of crown corporations to produce what was necessary to get the job done. And that's what, that to me is a signal. Okay, they get it. So They're important. on it. So important. And I feel like, you know, more and more people were recognizing that, recognizing how dependent we were on big pharma to get us through yeah. this. You know, that's a dangerous yeah. place to be. Yeah. Well... Sad. I can't I can't finish without saying, you know, the other key thing is that we have to elect more true climate champions across a number of 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 caucuses mm -hmm. and parties. Mm -hmm. But in in Parkdale uh, High Park, uh, that means electing you. Ah. And I hereby uh, endorse uh, that endorsement. All right. We've got this recorded. So uh, thank you for that, Seth. And, you know. Uh, when I'm elected, I'll be doing all I can alongside my uh, hopeful caucus mates like Matthew Green and Leah Gazan to do all that we can to really make sure that we're fighting the climate emergency like we want to win. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for joining me, Seth. I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts and expertise with me today. Uh, to me, it's all connected. And I think you spoke about this. You know, we'll never achieve some of the other things that are really important to us as well. Racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, food justice, disability justice, if we don't have climate justice. So I, I think this is a really pivotal moment for us. And to folks who are listening, thanks uh, to all those that tuned into our conversation today. You know, to, together we're building a movement. So as we work for change in all of our campaigns, be it political or any other type of organizing that we do, let's ensure that we're doing all that we can to stand up for the planet, its defenders, and our collective future.